So many of you will agree with me that it takes a certain level of intelligence and depth of knowledge to just read through an entire article in The Economist magazine. So our next session host has not only read several, but he has published three of his own. A warm welcome to Raghuveer Srinivasan, the editor of Business Line from the Hindu Group. He's a chartered accountant and cost accountant with over 28 years of experience in journalism, all of them with the Hindu Group. He was business editor of the Hindu before he took over as editor of Business Line. He's an avid watcher of the economy and tracks automobiles and energy sector, among others, very closely. He's written several editorials over the years on the economy, markets, banking, and apart from analytical articles in the Business Line and the Hindu. He began his career in journalism in 1993 when the paper was launched as a research analyst. He's awarded the Sheving Scholarship for Young Journalists by the British government's Foreign and Commonwealth Office in 2000. And he spent a semester studying journalism at the University of Westminster in London. As a part of the scholarship, he also interned at The Economist in London. Raghuveer is a fellow of the Foreign Press Center, Tokyo, Japan. And we welcome him this evening for an exciting session with Nandini Vijay Raghavan. Over to you, Raghuveer. Thank you. Thank you, Subha. Thank you for that uh, kind introduction. Good evening, everyone, and thanks for this invitation to be here at the Bangalore Business Lit Fest. It's a pleasure, and uh, uh, especially because I have a most interesting person to chat with over the next half an hour, and a, a very well-researched, excellent book. Nandini Vijay Raghavan, uh, the author of Unfinished Business. Nandini is, uh, for a formal introduction, Nandini is a corporate finance professional with extensive experience in researching Asia-Pacific corporates. Her writings, the columns, case studies, and books focus on the Asian business landscape and her translation of Tamil works of literature into English. Her maiden corporate biography was called the Singapore Blue Chips. And her debut publication is an English translation of the well-known Tamil uh, writer Kalki Krishnamurti's classic, Sivagami in Sabadam. This is a four-volume novel and the book and Kindle versions are available on Amazon and Flipkart. Nandini's translations of Kalki's uh, sequel to Sevagami in Sabadam, Party One Kanaval, was published in 2020. I have read her books, uh, both uh, the maiden English one, Corporate Biography, Singapore Blue Chips, as well as her Tamil uh, translations. They're excellent. And uh, she's done as, as much as one can do justice to Kalki who's a great, it's not possible to match him, but he's done justice to the translation of his uh, books. Uh, Nandini is born and raised in Chennai. She holds postgraduate degree in economics from Tufts University and is a finance uh, uh, graduate from the London Business School and is also a CFA charter holder. That's for a formal introduction. I've known Nandini for the last five, six years. She is the quintessential Chennai Vasi, Mylapurian conservative heart of Chennai. I may, with due respect, call her as Mylapur, describe her as Mylapur Mami too. She loves her filter coffee and she, though she lives in Singapore, her heart is in Chennai and uh, she doesn't miss a chance to go to the well-known, for those in Bangalore, uh, the equivalent of your MTR and CTR, which is Karpagambal Mess in Chennai's Mylapur. She loves her uh, visits there uh, every morning for breakfast, whenever she's in Chennai. And she's a regular, if you want to meet her, the best time to do that would be the December uh, music season in Chennai, when you'll run into her on all those sabhas, sitting, uh, sitting and listening or losing herself to the music coming out of the uh, stage. So, Nandini, welcome. Thank you. And, uh, uh, let me first start by congratulating you on an excellent, well-researched book, uh, a book that uh, would make a journalist proud uh, and a book that I would probably recommend to my colleagues to read uh, when it is out very soon. Thank you very much. Yeah. So let me start. Your book uh, uh, chronicles four high-flying businessmen, starting with Vijay Malya, Naresh Goyal, Anil Ambani, and the late B.G. Siddhartha. They were all high flying once upon a time, but were grounded for various reasons. Do you see anything common in the stories of these four businessmen whom you have chronicled in the book? 
Right. First of all, they were all born within a decade of each other. So when India was liberalized in the 90s, they were all in their late 20s, early 30s. And so they did not have to face the kind of uh, red tapism and bureaucracy the previous generation had to face. The second thing is, uh, you know, they had access to, uh, you know, banks, uh, friends in political circles, except for Naresh Goyal, who was, you know, born in a modest family. The rest of the gentlemen were born in affluent, well-connected uh, families. So they all had the kind of advantage uh, an average educated person of their vin vintage in India would not have had. And Naresh Goel, you he made up for uh, the lack of the initial advantage through his excellent networking skills and contacts, both amongst financiers and politicians. So, uh, and uh, they developed their companies to become market leaders uh, in the respective industries uh, they operated in. But their risk appetite was way off the charts. So how do you balance uh, getting a good product and a brand to the market and sustain it and make it a sustainable business, which means your finances should be uh, in order? How do you engage with politicians? They were not the first people to engage with politicians. G.D. Birla did, did it, J.R.D. Tata, Dhirubhai Ambani, Mukesh Ambani, and now the Adanis. So uh, they were not the first people to be politically connected. But what distinguishes entrepreneurs who further their businesses using political contacts and those who get sucked into that vortex? That is what this book tries to explore apart from uh, apart from the uh, obvious political support that they got uh, during the growth of their respective businesses in growing their respective businesses uh, was it also something that was uh, uh, one can describe as overweening ambition to uh, ambition running ahead of themselves uh, when they had successful businesses but still trying to get more successful if that is possible uh the overwinning ambition which uh, brought them to the ground like for instance vijay malya uh, he had an excellent liquor business going and uh, as they say the best way for a billionaire to become a millionaire is to start an airline and he did exactly that right, right. so is it ambition yes um i i would describe these entrepreneurs as icarus entrepreneurs you know they soar to the sky uh, uh, powered by the waxy paraffin wings of political connections on one side and debt on the other. And uh, if you don't have cash flows from your businesses backing that, you get scorched and fall to the ground. And uh, that is what happened to these gentlemen. Yeah. So it is, it's more... Uh miscalculation in their businesses, taking on more risks than they should have, uh, you know, that probably was their nemesis, right? That's right. Correct. Yeah. But uh, is, are these kind of businessmen unique to the Indian landscape or in your experience from sitting where you are in Singapore, uh, researching Asia Pacific, do you see similar uh, instances elsewhere in the world? Yes. Yes. Including uh, I mean, it, it still happens in Europe, Wirecard, it still happens, uh, you know, uh, in the US, the entire global financial crisis and mortgage-backed securities and Archibald's capital more recently. So this entire human ambition and greed getting ahead of itself and ignoring the fundamentals is by no means unique to India. It happens across the world. And also in the Indian context, if you had looked at Reliance before the, the massive fundraising of 2019 or the entire house of debt reports between 2012 and 15, uh, you know, there are all these uh, companies which were over leveraged. Let's, let's begin with uh, the house of uh, debt reports put out by Credit Suisse. It's there in the public uh, domain, an excellent report for everyone to uh, see and uh, 
so uh, every single entity covered, whether it was GMR or Landcore or uh, the Reliance ADAG group, that is the Anil Dhirubhai Ambani group, collapsed, barring one entity, uh, which is the Adanis. Uh, they're still going strong with financed by debt on one side. They have great execution skills, but they're supported by debt on one side and political connections on the other. So, uh, so this is by no means unique, but it's just the similarities of these four uh, gentlemen which prompted me to write this book. Excellent. I was, I mean, you mentioned Adani's. I was uh, that was the subject of my next question. Uh, I wanted to, uh, you know, just probe you uh, whether uh, the lessons from the demise, not a uh, demise of the businesses or rather the fall from grace of these uh, four gentlemen, hmm. whether the lessons have been learned in India by businessmen, or are we seeing a repeat of uh, some of these tragic stories of uh, leveraging, over leveraging, building on your businesses when you already have a successful business to fall back upon, to run, uh, trying to get into unrelated areas, diversifying without uh, logic. Uh, do you see any of that still happening or have lessons been learned? No, uh, the lessons haven't been learned by all stakeholders, sadly. And and it's not just in India, as uh, the final chapter of uh, my book says, world over the lessons haven't learned, been learned. And the stakeholders, bankers and lenders doing their due diligence before uh, lending monies, credit rating agencies, uh, you know, uh, sometimes it's a genuine professional lapse, but uh, sometimes even the rating agencies get sucked in this market euphoria and uh, either delay or make wrong calls. And the regulators, uh, you know, uh, they are usually slow to uh, react. And, and my uh, disappointment with India is that we don't have an active whistleblowing uh, uh, mechanism with the identity of the whistleblower protected. I mean, it's it's really sad, this entire ICICI Bank saga. Uh, you know, there was this uh, shareholder in ICICI Bank and Videocon who deciphered what was happening and he put it up in a blog and it took five years for the whole thing to blow up. And Ireland FS, their profits declined. They, everyone says complex business, complex business. But their profits were declining. They started making losses. They started paying dividends out of uh, their reserves. And for the spectacular performance, the senior management team was given nice rises. There were tons of whistleblowers on the other side. So um, the sad saga continues. And we as a capital scarce economy cannot afford this. So it is not just amongst businessmen, but it's also amongst regulators and uh, policymakers that lessons have not been learned. We are not putting in place systems uh, to ensure that there are no more uh, Siddharthas or Vijay Malyas uh, who can take the system for a ride. No, uh, sadly we are not. And the airline, yes. I mean, for everyone who says uh, begin with a billionaire and then uh, you can start an airline and become a millionaire, there's Indigo Airlines which showed that in a price uh, sensitive market like India, you can by the exactly the same model, your fleet ha has is homogeneous. You 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 save on the spare parts. You enter into favorable lease terms. You keep your debt low. You offer no frill service, and you make a profit and pay dividends year on year. That's the way you operate. But that aside, the regulator, three committees, uh, you know, have been constituted by the government. The Tim's committee in pre independent India the Rajya Daksh committee uh, in the 60s, if I'm not mistaken, and the Naresh Chandra committee in the 90s. And they said exactly the same thing. Government stay out of airlines, regulate the sector, and don't let too many players inside so that there's no price competition. But the government has ignored it again and again. And the latest escapade is one Udan, uh, you know, uh, which is uh, the hub and spoke model with the government trying to connect the small towns to the metros uh, through flights. We have good railways. We have great buses. Why this? Uh, 
skill. So that is something uh, uh, which is, and now the government refuses to learn from the airline experience and wants to fund BSNL, which is a debt business. We don't learn our lessons. We don't learn our lessons, yeah. I think that would apply as much to uh, uh, other countries as well, right? Is it a curse of capitalism in a way uh, that uh, people uh, get greedy beyond a point and uh, uh, regulators uh, are always two steps behind? I agree with you on that. Capitalism works uh, not because it's efficient, but because a more efficient way of doing business hasn't been uh, discovered. And uh, so business losses and these stratospheric valuations which happened in the IPOs last year with most of the stocks languishing now, the loss of capital both through such overpriced listing and failed businesses are the curse uh, of capitalism and we in India are refusing to be more careful because we are, despite being a capital scarce economy. Yeah, that's right. So uh, as I said earlier, it's a very well researched book, deeply researched, and it has a lot of information. Uh, uh, as a financial analyst yourself, you have put out several tables, several graphics that talk about the numbers of each of these uh, gentlemen, which uh, uh, led to their uh, uh, eventual uh, exits. How difficult was it for you to gather the information? How difficult was it to uh, get to the primary sources of uh, information? And how long did it take for you to write this book? It um, took me about a year uh, to write uh, the book. And um, actually, uh, the, the the effort put to collate the information and analyze it was difficult but the information per se is there it's easily available uh, which kind of led me to the conclusion that it was not genius which leads to fraud and failures uh, it is just lapses in oversight because it, even in the case of island fs or jet or kingfisher airlines the information was was there i mean how could bankers convert uh, the debt to equity at a price of kingfisher airline that prevailed three years ago the current price is one third that price would you do it if it was your money so it was obviously chronic capitalism yeah so uh i know your you're uh, not a religious person too much, but uh, you do read extensively on religion. You're read on religion and uh, you're also spiritually oriented. Uh, would you think that uh, the stories of these four people, uh, gentlemen, who you uh, that you've chronicled, the ending is a bit of karma getting back. Uh, you know, you build your business using unethical means cutting corners, uh, grabbing public money from banks, not repaying them. And then uh, you discover that uh, whatever you try to build with all that is uh, it's coming crashing down. So is that karma getting back? I, I suppose Newton's law is a linear interpretation of karma. So uh, when you, when when the these entrepreneurs uh, consciously or un and unconsciously harmed the other stakeholders in an economy, uh, at some point, you know, it worked to their detriment. So uh, that is the. Uh, of course, you, you you can cite multiple cases and say it didn't happen to this person and it is not happening to some other person. Uh, we would have to wait and launch because these, this empire building based on debt is just not sustainable. So, uh, and there are limits to human ability. So if, if these are the takeaways, uh, I think, I mean, this is what I learned while writing this book, because there's, there's no reason why these gentlemen were smart, they were savvy, they were well-connected they had an advantage with which very few of us 
have, and yet they tripped. That's right. Uh, someone like uh, Anil Ambani, um, he was uh, given a set of well-run businesses, uh, running businesses, and also cash, uh, a lot of cash, uh, he understand, uh, uh, was given to him as compensation for Reliance Industries going to the elder brother. Right. But uh, all of that was squandered, right? So uh, True. it is and not just... Expansion yes, after expansion. I mean, it was that... Uh, I mean, first of all, uh, yes, he got a lot of money because the split Reliance Industries was the cash cow. So uh, the companies, he, he got a bunch of startups which were highly indebted. And he need... I mean, he since it was... A bequest the money had to be given to him to to make up for the cash cow but the breakneck expansion you know reliance power real reliance communication reliance capital and even when the entire conglomerate was in trouble uh reliance naval the uh, the defense uh business it was clearly unsustainable yeah I have a couple of questions from readers. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, from uh, people watching the show. As a journalist, readers come naturally to me. Pardon me for that. <laughs> so this question is, uh, it says, was it only appetite for risk or there were ethical issues to the core which led to the downfall of these uh, businessmen? Okay. So, uh, as I said, uh, um, when it comes to uh, Vijay Malia, uh, he was in the parliamentary committee for civil aviation and he was heading an airline which meant, uh, you know, he could fashion legislation to his benefit. So, uh, it is not only, it was not only unethical of Vijay Malia, but it was also unethical of the government to have, to have done that. Similarly, the famous 5 by 20 rule of Naresh Goel saying an airline the whole thing was done, uh, you know, airlines have to fly for five years and have a fleet of 20 aircraft before they can uh, go to international airlines. That was that was done so that jet airways had uh, the first mover advantage uh, when it came to international uh, routes. So, uh, uh, yes, uh, there were, in addition, it is this high risk appetite, which I suppose nudges people to act in unethical ways because they only see they're only keen to build empires whether these empires are sustainable or not probably doesn't strike them yeah and when you when you have friends in government who will uh, uh, grease the process for you to get uh, a good loan or convert a bad loan into equity uh, like as you mentioned in the case of kingfisher airline or uh, fashion policies to your uh, benefit, like how Naresh Goyal did with <clears throat> airline policy in this country. Right. So I think it's very easy to uh, adopt unethical means. Absolutely. You're right. Yeah. So there's another question. Um, crony capitalism is on the rise. Is it linked to political parties' funding needs? Do you cover this connection between political parties, funding needs, and crony capitalism? Uh, not in the book. I hope to write more books uh, down uh, the line. But uh, yes, but uh, when you read the book, you, you realize that uh, money has been channeled to unexplained uh, sources. Uh, in the case of some of the gentlemen, uh, uh, covered uh, in the book. Okay. Um, this, uh, actually, we have quite a few questions here for you. Um, maybe I'll pick up a couple. Um, there's a gentleman who wants to know, are there steps taken by the Indian government to ensure sufficient checks and balances are put in place to prevent such fraud committed by these people? If so, are these happening fast enough? Well, the checks and balances are in place, but then uh, I was uh, watching uh, Shekhar Gupta's, uh, you know, uh, cut the clutter, 
and uh, in one of the episodes he mentions that uh, uh, Sharad Power uh, helped Vijay Malia get a loan even when uh, Kingfisher was uh, uh, reportedly uh, broken. So in the case of public sector uh, banks, there is this telephone banking which goes on. So 90% of the loans goes through due process and then the top boss calls and says give the loan and then the the credit appraisal is written to you know to meet that purpose so that happens in the case of public sector banks and in the case of private sector banks also some decisions are taken top down and as long as bonuses in private sector banks are tied to the disbursements made and are and are given upfront in the form of cash bonuses and employee stock options this uh a chase for disbursement will happen. It's not staggered. I mean, nobody tells a relationship manager, I will pay 50% of your cash bonus today and then 25% next year and 25% the year after, depending on how your loans will perform. Then it is in the, and it doesn't happen world over. It's not just India. So as long as your incentives are skewed, such lapses will happen. Okay, there's a request that the names of the questioners be announced. So the last question was by Arun Arbugam. Okay, uh, I'll move on to the next one. Hmm. This is from Sridhar Kalyana Raman. Hmm. Where or what is the deterrent for the lenders? If nothing has changed, then is it business as usual? Uh, see, the deterrent for uh, the lenders is uh, the, the, the telephone email connections between uh, politicians and public sector banks should be cut and uh, the bonuses and compensation structure for uh, private sector banks uh, should be changed. If this doesn't happen, then uh, asset quality uh, of banks and we are a bank loan dependent market and it will also help to uh, to um, diverse it's to somehow kickstart india's bond market because uh you know if, if a company performs badly and uh, uh the bond price starts falling uh the bond yield will go up basically and then bankers will find it very difficult to justify why they are lending money to these lenders at low interest rates so it, it for the bank to save the banks from themselves it pays to have a vibrant bond market so, Even a corporate bond market. Yes, it, it should be made a lot more vibrant so that uh, there is a check in balance. In I mean, there are enough checks and balances, but uh, the optimists that we are, we do hope if there's a bond market, some more sense will be uh, dinned into the bankers. That's come from coming from a debt analyst. Uh, I think it should be taken seriously. Uh, Arun Kumar Ralapalli wants to know whether the senior scenario would be different in Singapore, something like this would ever happen in a place like Singapore. Things have happened in Singapore. Uh, two commodity traders, uh, uh, one of which was a Temasek portfolio uh, company, uh, you know, was a victim of a short seller attack, Olam, uh, whose founder is incidentally of Indian origin. And just now the Hong Kong commodity trader, the Noble Group uh, was fined. But because uh, the political uh, system in Singapore is uh, different, Singapore banks too have non-performing assets, but the level is much lower because you don't have telephone banking uh, that much in Singapore. But once again, Singapore is a bank loan dependent market and the bond market is not as large or vibrant. So okay. that is also something we need to uh, take into account. So I know we are almost out of time. Just one last question from another uh, viewer. This is mm -hmm. Mr. Ramesh Kumar. He wants to know, there are many bankrupt business, uh, businessmen on a much bigger scale than Malia. Would you say that they are not in the limelight so much because they are also flamboyant in their lifestyles, like in steel or mining industries? Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, I agree with that. And... Uh, I should uh, congratulate and uh, convey my uh, appreciation to Ravi Nandula, uh, Business Lines cartoonist whom uh, Raghuveer uh, introduced to me. So he gave me a cartoon to end the book, uh, which says, uh, 
there is there's a part meet and greet for high net worth uh, individuals and uh, one banker tells the other his is a rags to riches story rags for the bankers and riches to himself so uh, so that that is the story of uh, entrepreneurship uh, in india thank you nandini it was a pleasure talking to you and i look forward to reading the book and uh, publishing more of your columns in business line i omitted to mention that nandini has been a columnist in business line for the last 6 years and has written excellent columns for us look forward to seeing more of you in business line thank you so much uh, bangalore business lit fest and good evening to all of you again thank you thank yeah. you very much thank you nandini for watching this and thanks um, shankar and benedict for giving me this opportunity Pleasure is ours. Thank you. So we've had an exciting four sessions today. I think it's it's nice to see the trajectory that we took. We started with really the the potential of India. We heard directly from Shark. Uh, we heard we had a moderator who's talking who's written about youngsters and how they are building businesses. Uh, we looked at how India can grow. What are the areas from solar to dairy to You know how India can grow, and then we reach the other end of the spectrum: the frauds, the the not so the not so nice stories, the the characters that have eroded some of the wealth of this nation. So we've really traversed the entire trajectory, and a very very uh, interesting conversations this evening. Thank you to all our authors and speakers and moderators. Benedict, over to you. Bye bye. Yes. So yeah, final thank you to Raghuveer and uh, Nandini. Be in touch soon. Thank you, Benedict. It was a yeah. pleasure. Same. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much, uh, Subha, for anchoring this today's session excellently.